My name is Marina Sofos, and I'm a program director at ARPA-E. I'd like to thank you in advance for listening to this webinar on urban air mobility. This is a topic that is generating a lot of buzz for its potential role in transforming portions of our transportation networks. In this webinar, I'll be giving an overview of how we at ARPA-E are starting to think about the overall energy use implications of urban air mobility as a means to determine where there might be opportunities for further exploration of this topic at the agency. It should be noted that we are not advocating for or against these systems at this stage, and the extent of their adoption is still to be determined. However, the transportation sector generates the largest share of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, which means that as our mobility systems continue to evolve, so will their energy impacts on the sector with implications, more importantly, on our overall emissions. As such, we're interested in proactively evaluating the energy use trade-offs of urban air mobility and identifying innovative ideas to improve their energy efficiency as the technology is further developed, as well as to inform further planning and their adoption. If you have any ideas on this challenge, We'd love to hear from you. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues, Chris, Huthaifa, Rusty, and Dipankar for their contributions to this presentation. And now let's dive in. To start, Technologies for Urban Air Mobility, or UAM for short, are being developed as an alternative to ground transportation with the goal of reducing trip times, thereby also reducing congestion on roadways. Pictured here are examples of two such aerial vehicles by NASA and Joby Aviation. Now the extent of UAM adoption is not yet determined, which means that the implications on total energy usage are unknown and just beginning to be fully explored. Advancements to the aerial vehicle itself, such as electrical storage and capacity, as well as adv advanced propulsion systems offer opportunities for energy efficiency improvements as well. In addition, and where we like to understand if there's potential for further exploration, is in utilizing the connectivity and automation being developed to operate these vehicles as a means to optimize maneuvers as well as coordinate across possible networks so as to save energy um, across the system. As the name implies, UAM are defined as air transit systems for point-to-point -point passenger travel and or freight delivery at low altitudes within populated locations. Personal air transportation of this nature already exists in the form of helicopters, but UAM vehicles are being developed with vertical takeoff and landing or VTOL capability, which eliminates the need for a runway offering locational flexibility similar to a helicopter combined with the more efficient aerodynamic flight profile of an airplane. Potential benefits as noted before include the reduced congestion that can result and strain on existing transportation networks being reduced. A notional qualitative scenario is depicted here laying out an end-to-end -end comparison for a proposed ride hailing passenger use case with existing ground services. And even with the added steps of transit to and from the heliports, along with the climb and descent of the aerial vehicle itself as shown, time should be saved on the overall trip due to the more efficient routing at cruising altitude and reduction in congestion that would exper be experienced on the ground during the comparable leg. The actual adoption of these systems, however, will rely on several factors listed here. All of these topics are under active investigation by the FAA and NASA, along with SAE, ASTM, and local and state entities as applicable. Now, while outside of our scope, the reason we make note of here is simply because these topics will also inform further improvements to efficiency. While the future remains to be seen, a number of efforts are underway, including the announcement and formation of public-private partnerships 
and active testing of prototypes to further develop the technology, along with the supporting infrastructure and certification needed for eventual deployment. So it's prudent at this time to further understand the energy use implications. And so with that, let's take a look. A recent study conducted for NASA evaluated life cycle emissions and found on average that on a per passenger mileage basis at the vehicle level, while electric based propulsion systems should generate less than half the emissions of a traditional helicopter, they are still comparable to gas powered light duty passenger ground vehicles when performing the same trip and accounting for the extra distance typically required on the road versus in the air, a factor of 1.42. An all electric five seat piloted electric powered VTOL occupied at 75% load factor is expected to generate twice the emissions of an all electric car. In this case, a Tesla Model S with the average occupancy rate of one and a half passengers per vehicle. It should be noted that these numbers do not include the energy required to perform any reserve missions and dead end trips. Additional factors influencing these numbers will include weather, which can cause rerouting along with the aerial vehicle design itself. And so while this is just one analysis, it really highlights the importance of further considering energy efficiency technologies for these emerging types of vehicles and networks. Considering their energy use further, a recently developed model by University of Michigan has investigated the role of trip distance on energy consumption of vehicles for UAM. As noted earlier, the flight path will consist of five phases, the takeoff or hover phase, followed by ascent to cruising altitude, at which point the vehicle under ideal conditions will travel as straight as path as possible to the destination. Finally, the vehicle descends before landing with descent itself assumed to be largely negligible of emissions. The team's analysis found that at distances up to 20 kilometers, the more energy intensive hover phase dominates as shown here in terms of the primary energy consumed. Longer distances at efficient cruising altitudes, therefore, compensate for this penalty. And so, as shown on the bottom right, when comparing to ground vehicles, assuming a single occupancy in each case and normalized by vehicle kilometers traveled, the VTOL begins to consume less energy than a gas-powered ground vehicle at 120 kilometers but still continues to consume more than an all electric powered car up to 250 kilometers. The next question is how level of adoption and diversion of traffic from the road to the skies affect overall energy consumption. A lot of variables are still unknown given the early stage nature of the technology. So a rigorous study is not yet feasible but let's consider two possible scenarios. In the first, overall energy consumption is reduced due to at most a modest increase in air travel, along with a reduction in road consumption due to widespread usage of highly efficient vehicles for air travel. Enough decongestion occurs on the roads, especially for lower efficiency powertrain vehicles that benefit the most. Aerial trips, are mostly long, longer distance with extended cruising and are taken to and from popular destinations occupied at full capacity. And finally, air operations are fully optimized with limited rerouting due to weather or air traffic. In the other scenario, overall energy consumption increases due to an appreciable increase in air travel consumption that is not offset by a reduction in road consumption. Factors that would lead to this include the utilization of lower efficiency aerial vehicles, including gas powered ones, as well as the displacement of mostly high efficiency or electric drive vehicles on the road, where decongestion has a more modest effect on improving their on-road consumption. Additional travel would be brought on due to the convenience 
including shorter distance trips where takeoff dominates the energy consumption profile, as well as their use for single passenger transit when, with unoccupied return trips. And finally, little network optimization res would result in more securitous routing and inefficient maneuvering. There are several areas to consider for improving the energy efficiency of the aerial vehicle itself, akin to other vehicles in aircraft, but customized to UAM operations and mission requirements. To name a few, coupled with electrification, these include aerodynamic design improvements, such as distributed propulsion, where multiple smaller rotors, motors can be used with greater flexibility, providing high system redundancy and design optimization, and also enabling noise reduction. The graph below, for example, illustrates how the range of the vehicle is influenced by these design choices. Advancements in electrical energy storage and capacity, including recharging times, also play a role. In this context, ARPA-E funded the IONIX program, focusing on solid ion conductors for batteries and fuel cells. And the recently funded REACH and ASCEND programs are targeting electric aviation requirements, specifically for narrow body passenger airplanes. What we are interested in here is to better understand with respect to UAMs, the role that connectivity and automation could also play in terms of unlocking additional energy savings for both the individual vehicle itself, as well as the network. For example, the ability for a passenger to also serve as a pilot through sufficient autonomous functionality could have the added benefit of allowing for higher passenger loading. In the previously cited Michigan study, as the number of passengers increase in an aerial vehicle and the average 1.5 occupancy rate of a ground vehicle is still assumed, a 100 kilometer trip with three passengers begins to just barely beat the efficiency of EVs. In the ARPA-E Next Car program, increasing levels of partial and conditional automation, such as advanced driver assistance systems, were utilized to develop vehicle dynamic and powertrain control strategies that could yield 20% energy savings in ground-based passenger vehicles without extensive powertrain architecture or vehicle hardware modifications. And in the Transnet program, new network control architectures and technologies coupled with incentive strategies were developed to encourage individual travelers to take specific energy relevant actions with the aim of minimizing ener energy consumption and personal transportation without having to improve current infrastructure or vehicle efficiency. Most of the UAM vehicles being developed are expected to have the capability to be fully autonomous, initially piloted, but eventually transitioning toward automated control. The hierarchy of automation is being developed to evolve from where a human has direct control of the automation systems all the way to where the human is only informed or engaged by the automation syst systems to take action when necessary. In the next car program, technologies developed leverage varying levels of autonomous functionality along with preview and look ahead information obtained from connectivity. The graphs shown here are the results of savings for individual strategies developed, such as eco routing, eco driving, and hybrid energy flow optimization. Efficiency gains here are specific to each individual vehicle and conditions tested, such as the vehicle duty cycle, traffic density, preview length, and weather conditions. But an aggregate total of 20% improvement in energy efficiency appears to be readily attainable for both gas powered as well as hybrid and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles tested. Based on these results, we are interested in identifying the similar opportunities for facilitating energy efficient operation for UAM through connectivity and automation and finding out how big a role this could play in terms of impact. For example, as shown here, a multi-phase 
optimal control framework was developed to determine the energy efficient arrival trajectories for several landing maneuvers, including the transition from cruise to descent with a fixed required time of arrival for an electric VTOL with the goal here being optimization against battery endurance limitations. So even as batteries and other components improve, how can these concepts be explored with additional data provided through connectivity as well as more autonomous functionality? Now in thinking beyond the individual vehicle, but across the UAM network, the three-dimensional airspace will need to be used safely and efficiently to fully realize its benefits. A number of variables need to be accounted for, and because of the differences with ground transportation, as well as traditional air travel, new models are necessary for operation and fleet management, including decision-making around the type of service provided, on-demand versus pre-scheduled, as well as the optimal fleet size. The FAA recently published the first concept of operations for urban air mobility, an initial roadmap for how the United States might achieve high volume urban air taxi operations while maintaining the safety of the national airspace through defined UAM corridors as shown on the top left. One of the goals would be the ability to exchange information across aerial vehicles to deconflict traffic without relying on air traffic control. A recently developed model with its components shown on the top right for on-demand operations provides a starting point in comparing different forms of service. Constraints that are considered include departure and arrival, scheduling horizon and sequencing, trajectory management to ensure safe spatial and temporal separation, conflict resolution and integration with traditional flight operations, air traffic control, and optimal required time of arrival. With increasing levels of connectivity, these types of models could be further explored to unlock additional energy savings at the network level and across the collective UAM and ground transportation networks, including, for example, most energy efficient routing, as well as the determination of when and where to rely on which mode of transportation. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to this webinar. And if you have any disruptive ideas for the role that technology is adding functionality to connectivity and automation can play in reducing the energy consumption of UAM systems beyond existing energy efficiency strategies, we'd love to hear from you. More information can be found at the links posted. Thank you.